I am loving Queer as Folk, uh, and I'm already in love with Ruthie and Cher uh, as dynamic relationship. Um, we meet them when they're already well into it, of course. Uh, so what can you each say about uh, your perspective on how they met or where they have come from up to this point? I think wanna... how... oh, no, yeah. no. I was gonna say how they met versus where they are now are definitely two completely different worlds. Um, you know, shares in a punk band and Ruthie is definitely a little bit of a party girl. So uh, where they started to where they are now, they, they definitely are in the process of trying to reclaim their roots. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love the like trio dynamic with Brody of which you both have uh, somewhat differing perspectives about. So CG, if you could talk to the little bit of friction between Cher and Brody. Yeah, I mean, you know, Brody and Ruthie come from way back and Ruthie and Cher come from kind of, you know, a more recent way back. So, of course, <laughs> there are things that Cher knows about Ruthie that Brody might not know about Ruthie. And there are a lot of things that Brody, Brody knows about Ruthie that Cher doesn't know about Ruthie. So I think that that's one of the players in the tension between the two of them and just how those relationships are uh, just kind of weighted differently. Absolutely. Now, I think it's so important to get to see uh, like non-traditional roads to parenthood that can only come from a perspective like a room full of LGBTQ writers um, because, you know, cis straight people may not know yeah. what goes on. Uh, so can you talk about embodying that in this storyline and what it feels like for you? I mean, well, getting to see two queer parents who one of them isn't necessarily ready to be a parent is major. I mean, so often with uh, stories about queer people becoming parents, in, in reality, they need to work so much harder for that, you know, um, either financially or through adoption or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, a, a lot of the queer experience is found family. And I think what's beautiful about our show is there's this incredible found family in this group of friends. And then also a really modern take on a family dynamic with, with children. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, it's, it's so fun that we get to, to explore both of those things on the show. Absolutely. Now the premiere really, uh, like, I guess climax is in like a, a terrifying event. That's obviously meant to be reminiscent of a uh, pulse, but it is handled like, I think it's handled very, very like well and carefully, but what was it like having to deal with that? And then also like carry that through in the story? Uh, CG, CG as someone who wasn't, you know, there, but your character has to know that your loved ones have gone through that. Yeah, I mean, when I first read that this was the tragedy taking place in New Orleans, the place that I'm from, a place of, you know, freedom and creativity and spirit and just all of the things of goodness, I was a little uh, shaken and like, oh, no, but why? Why do we have to do why? Why? But then uh, while I was speaking to Jacqueline, Jacqueline Moore, one of the showrunners on the show, she actually filled me in on one of the largest hate crimes before Pulse to take place in New Orleans at the Upstairs Lounge, which I did not know about, and I'm from there. So to know that that took place on the land in real life and knowing Pulse and knowing how that is reflected in the show, just all three of those uh, aspects kind of just feel like a reckoning and an honoring of those people who were lost and the people who were not lost. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you are both fabulous. The show so far is amazing and I cannot wait to see your relationship grow. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys. Excited for you to see the rest. <laughs>